According to energy industry experts, we're in the middle of a massive expansion of renewable energy sources and it is likely to continue. At the UN Climate Conference in Dubai at the end of last year, governments committed to tripling global capacity by 2030 and the International Energy Agency, for one, is pretty bullish about that goal being achieved. The question is, will every part of the world benefit? After all, the member states of the United Nations have signed up to ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all at the end of the decade. Moritz Brauchler is the Director General of Africa Green Tech. Madagascar, a social enterprise which provides sustainable energy solutions to some of the 600 million people in sub-Saharan Africa currently living without any access to electricity at all. And he joins me from, I think, a hotel room, Moritz, in the Malgash capital, Antananarivo. Hello. Hello, Connor. That's correct. And uh, yeah, I know it's an evening for you already. There's a bit of a big time difference between New York and Madagascar. So I appreciate your time. Well, let, let's start with your company, Africa Green Tech. And I know you receive support from Sustainable Energy for All. That's an international organization that works closely with the UN for faster adoption of clean energy. But just boil it down for me. Give me an overview of what you do. Of course. Thank you. So w what we do can be uh, described in three different business units. The uh, business unit where we come from and where we're the strongest is the rural electrification. So we go into areas in sub-Saharan Africa, Africa where the people have no access to electricity whatsoever. And we build usually solar power plants, put up battery storage, build a distribution network and like really create the energy access from scratch. That's where we come from and that's our DNA basically. And give me an idea more or less how many people are we talking about in Madagascar who, who have never had access to electricity? Yeah, unfortunately, um, this is still two thirds of the population, even if we take the most op optimistic cases. So, yeah, a lot to do for us. And why is that? Like, what, what have been the problems that have held up people from having access to electricity in the past? Yeah, it's a, it's a wide range of, of issues. Um, so first of all, the state utility, which is um, supplying most of the people at the moment being, um, they struggle financing. And also the, the issue is that they are running currently on uh, diesel, which is very costly. So they are struggling finding additional finance to expand the national grid to connect more people. And uh, diesel is obviously polluting. This is something that we as a global community want to move away from. So. How can mini grids or microgrids help? Actually, maybe explain what a microgrid is. How does that work? So um, a mini grid or microgrid, actually the, the two wordings are used, is a standalone network. So it is not connected to the national grid, but it is completely cut off from the environment. So typically, like in the past, it used to be a diesel generator, which is then connected to a distribution network. What we are now trying to do is to replace that, or not just trying to do, we are doing it, to replace that diesel chance set with renewable energies and then supply to people in a small town or bigger town or a couple of communities uh, with that electricity. So you're doing it with renewables. As you say, it's, it's not connected to a wider national grid. Um, so yeah. what happens if the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing or how, how can you guarantee regular supply of electricity? First of all, um, the people here are used, if there is state utility, people are used to have four, five, six, maybe eight or 10 hours a day of electricity. So we, we have to step back a bit from the uh, Northern Hemisphere thinking that a minute a, a year, what we typically, for example, have in Germany is, is a big disaster for the people. It's not. Um, looking at where, the, where we are starting, if we have a 20 hour supply, we are more than fine. And at the moment being what we achieve with a solar uh, combined with battery solution is um, within the last one and a half years in our mini grid in Madagascar, we had two outages of three to four hours. So that's where we are looking at. So yeah, long story short, we combine it with a battery storage to have enough backup in case there is no sunshine, for example. So you're starting from scratch. So this is already a, a big improvement on what went before. But 
Is it realistic to imagine scaling up? For example, could you connect lots of these grids together to, to form a kind of a, a larger grid? That's actually what we are currently doing um, together with the German development aid agency GIZ. Um, they are developing uh, a new platform approach, which is called IDF. It's Integrated uh, Distribution Framework. So we're not just looking into completely isolated mini grids, but we're also looking at how we can interconnect them and then in the end have a complete region electrified. And that's what we plan to do for the next couple of years. So yes, mini grids are one solution, but in the long run, the goal is always to interconnect mini grids to an interconnected grid and if possible in the really long run to integrate it into the state grid i guess the question is is this technology commercially viable long term in your organization you you're getting grants uh, to help set set this up uh, you're working in countries that are developing economies that don't have much spare cash to go around. So can you envisage a future where this sort of technology is put in so people have clean grids and the government can can bring in money from it, can, uh, can have tax revenue or some way that doesn't require grants from aid organizations in the future? That definitely would require a couple of things to change. The first of all, um, the money earned with uh, carbon emission certificates has to rise. So if we can, can have another revenue stream for our mini grid projects where we earn money because we remove carbon emissions because we replace diesel chansets or we avoid them in the first place, that's one important thing. So if, if the prices for the uh, emission certification rises, our case gets more profitable. That's the first case. Then the second thing is for the short and medium term we will need subsidies but we don't need the subsidies to generate the electricity that's comparably cheap where we need support either from the state or if the state is not capable of doing that from aid organizations like se for all so to set up the the grid from scratch that's costly and it stays there for the long term and of course many countries heavily subsidize uh, the production of fossil fuel energy anyway uh, is there been resistance Correct. in Madagascar, which is where you're based now? And what was it like trying to convince government officials, authorities to, to to move to this kind of energy production? No, they're they're actually um, the other way around. They're, they're strongly supportive. Um, what we are looking at is cooperation um, with the energy ministry here. Um, that works fairly well. The the thing is that. We have to give them some time to change the regulatory framework because now everything is set up for diesel generators and everything. So there's a lot of environmental permits and a lot of studies we have to do and everything. And this we have to get rid of because we need to speed up to get more people connected. Now, this might be a bit outside of your wheelhouse, but I know that Africa Green Tech Madagascar is part of a, a wider organization which is active in lots of different countries. So these conversations are going out uh, across the continent. And uh, as you probably know, at a, at a global level, developing countries are coming to COPs, to these UN climate conferences, and, and sometimes saying that they should be allowed to develop their fossil fuel resources uh, because they need to develop and they're not the ones who are responsible for most of the pollution. Are you getting, are you hearing those kind of arguments, you and your colleagues within Africa Green Tech, and how do you respond? Yes, we are hearing those arguments. And I must say, who are we to tell them to keep those resources in the ground? First of all, for those countries, it's an income stream. And if we look at countries like Norway, for example, um, which has its wealth from those resources and is now 100% green, but in the past it exploited oil and gas. So how can we tell the global south to keep those resources in the ground? If we should do that, I mean, we have to go uh, carbon neutral. If we do that, if we tell them, keep it in the ground, then we have to come up with a solution. So we have to subsidize renewable energies and we have to compensate them for the loss of income stream. So you're saying that the richer countries, the big polluters have to show that they're, they're playing the game and cutting their emissions. And also, yeah, financing is obviously the big issue. Where is the money coming from to, to, to develop these into 
these renewable resources and to give them more impetus to keep the oil and gas in the ground. Absolutely, absolutely. And for example, in Madagascar, it's not that big of an issue because the, the resources of oil and gas are pretty limited. Um, and the amount they're currently exploiting will be used within the country because we cannot switch a country like Madagascar within a couple of years to a 100% renewable energies with cars like EVs and everything. So at least for Madagascar, I would say it's not that big of an issue. Of course, there's countries in Africa which have a lot of natural gas and not a lot of oil where it's a different discussion. And finally, from your point of view, looking at these projects firsthand, have you been able to gauge the kind of difference this has made to people's lives? Definitely, definitely. And that's one of the, like, I get goosebumps when I just think about it. I'm now in Madagascar since October 2021, so a bit more than two years. When I've been first uh, time in the villages, which we now electrify, so we have been electrifying one village in 2021, and we started two more uh, in 2023. And when I've been first time in that pilot project in the village, at 6 p.m., everything was pitch black. You saw a few dots, a few solar lights, a few fireplaces. That's it. Everything was pitch black. The day was over. People are going home, maybe cooking, going to bed. That's it. Then after a certain amount of time, when we developed the project, when we implemented solar street lights, we implemented cooling, we implemented productive use of electricity. You go back to the village, people are selling ice cream on the street. You can drink juice, you can go to the cinema. Yeah, machinery running before that on diesel, rice husking mills, rice mills to create flour. Everything was running on diesel, was heavily polluting the air. Now they're switching the electricity on, the machine runs, it's, yeah. So literally night, Definitely. literally night and day difference. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And we wish you all the best. And uh, if you have any updates, we'd love to hear them. Thank you very much.